So Erin's the, the director of the Computational Ecology Lab at the University of Montana, and, and she's been working on simulations uh, in a landscape uh, genetics context for, for a long time and done some cool work. Um, I, I think that this talk is in many ways going to be preaching to the crowd because I see faces in the, in the room that, uh, use simulate, uh, that I know use some software I've written, their own software um, for doing simulations in, in, in many of the different applications I'm talking about. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you can use simulations for a zillion different purposes, and this slide shows that pretty well. I noticed that um, one thing that didn't show up here was uh, uh, parameter estimation and actual hypothesis testing, and we could use simulations for that as well. But for the purpose of, um, of this talk and, the, and this workshop, I should say, uh, Aaron outlined um, several of these that might really be important. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is basically go over three different applications that we could use for um, genetic simulations in, in, I think, the context of this workshop. And then Aaron also has a, uh, a description of some uh, demo genetic kinds of simulations she wants to talk about. Uh, they're great resources to go out and look for simulation software to address your problem if you don't know about these. Um, Sean and Sean and Oscar have, have uh, and Aaron as well, have, have written some great review papers. Um, it's always tempting when you see a new problem to say, I'm going to code up my own simulator. Often you don't need to do that. That's probably a canned piece of software out there already. Um, <clears throat> so these are the three things that I'm going to just quickly um, outline. Um, so. A classic use of simulation is power analysis or um, asking um, how sensitive a statistic might be to some sort of demographic process. Um, uh, we could develop simulation models themselves as the, the end target to try to understand a biological process. And then um, there's sometimes you just want to answer an empirical question, maybe a management question. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, these analytical kinds of evaluations are going to address the things that, that I think we all um, know are important, you know, how many markers you might have to employ in a study, uh, how sensitive, your as I said a second ago, your statistic might be for a, um, uh, some sort of demographic process that you're interested in. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you know, here's a set of examples of, of people um, doing this kind of work. Uh, you might ask, you know, how long until, um, I guess I'll look at it here, how long until um, uh, some sort of change in the environment is actually reflected in the genetics, um, how many markers do you really need to use, and um, uh, even, whoops, even ask questions about uh, how neutral and um, adaptive variation might, might differ under different um, demographic scenarios. So um, at the same time, Almost, I think in the history of population genetics, typically when a new statistic is developed, it's tested with some sort of numerical simulation. Um, but you may also just want a, um, a simulation model to you know, give you some understanding of stochasticity in a problem you're working on. And uh, you know, a, a great example of that is the allele surfing story that's um, become uh, uh, really popular in the past few years, um, where uh, genetic load accumulates at the margin of expanding populations. And here's the sort of canonical paper on that. Um, I, I noticed that I think that uh, I've got a wave of harmful mutation, not beneficial. That, that's a little incorrect there. Uh, but here's an example of how, um, how as a, a system of populations expands through time, we see the accumulation of genetic load deleterious mutations on that expanding front. <clears throat> so there are analytical solutions produced in this paper, but, uh, but the stochastic simulations are consistent with those and, and perhaps are somewhat more realistic. And then finally, um, you may want to know if I stock 100 fish into this population, what's going to be the impact of that stocking effort? And um, a simulation approach might be a good way of doing that. Uh, Sean and I got involved in a project uh, a few years ago where we were interested in ex situ um, uh, seed conservation. And there was a, uh, a well-known rule of thumb out there that uh, 
maybe 40, 50, 60 seeds per population would help us capture the amount of genetic variability that you would um, that you'd want to uh, capture and, and keep in your seed bank. Um, and so these graphs, basically, the axes are labeled, um, although unitless, and um, not in the paper, but on the, in the, on the slide they are. Uh, <clears throat> but the uh, ISO bars there are, um, are the proportion of alleles captured under different um, sampling strategies. And one of the take home messages here, and I, th I don't think this is gonna surprise anything, anybody, if you collect additional seeds from a single individual, you're not gonna capture a lot more additional alleles. Whereas if you add in additional individuals in your sampling strategy, you do. And this, this um, demonstrates that quite well. And it also demonstrates that uh, uh, the dispersal rates in these, um, in these populations have an impact on this pattern as well as mating system. Uh, instantly, these were all done with spatially explicit, true XY kinds of um, individual-based simulations. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, uh, we went out and looked at some actual uh, empirical data. So these are data sets where the sampling strategy was well explained in the literature and um, the, uh, the uh, um, number of alleles were actually captured were, were illustrated. And what we found was that uh, although we've come up with a more elaborate um, approach and something that's not, um, not quite a rule of thumb like we've seen before, it still didn't quite explain uh, what happened in the empirical data. And actually with, whoops, with this uh, Heliconia species, uh, we underestimated how many, no, we overestimated how many individuals you needed to actually sample alleles, whereas with this, um, this Quercus species, we did the exact opposite. And, and we're thinking that that has to do with um, uh, our, our, even though we did spatially explicit simulations, we didn't include a lot of um, discrete populations in, the, in those simulations. And maybe this population structure we missed could account for that. So in other words, this simulation's allowing us to either understand something about um, shortcomings in our model, or maybe more importantly, some biology that's gonna be important in conservation. <clears throat> so um, these are, this is the stuff that Aaron is really interested in right now, um, these demo genetic models. And, um, and essentially they're gonna be individually based, spatially explicit, and um, movement through that, that landscape is gonna be, um, uh, there's gonna be resistance based on either uh, landscape features or as you see here, riverine features. And so movement isn't exactly continuous. Um, and these processes all should be simulated. I, I do wanna point out that um, much can be learned by looking at neutral processes by themselves before we start simulating um, selection on top of that. Um, and as these simulations become more elaborate, the ability to actually include selection at the level of the genotype. So individuals with certain genotypes do well at certain points in the landscape relative to other genotypes. Um, but it's, um, it's certainly possible now, and I think increasingly interesting to start to look at um, the, the actual translation of the underlying genotypes into the expressed phenotypes and, and how those phenotypes themselves might influence fitness. And I think that's what, what she's trying to show here. Um, so instead of just ex looking at, does a particular genotype have a higher or low fitness, we could translate that through the, um, simulate essentially a polygenic inheritance and come up with traits that way. So um, different places we can go. Uh, now community colleges do simulations right now, um, but uh, there's, still, there's still room for it in community ecology. Um, <clears throat> uh, this idea of, of dealing with three-dimensional matrices um, in, in uh, particularly marine environments and aquatic environments, <clears throat> as well as um, looking at change, temporal changes in the environment instead of looking at static environments and how those might affect a sim, uh, uh, results of a simulation. Um, <clears throat> and as I said a second ago, adding in polygenic inheritance and maybe even more complicated um, 
epistatic and epigenetic processes uh, are certainly possible and um, I think an, a, a reasonable next direction to go. And so this is sort of the, the final slide. And then there's a summary, um, you know, how is this, what does this actually mean for us in this workshop? And I think one thing is if we come up with indicators, novel um, statistics, novel approaches, let's think about how we're gonna torture test them. And, and one approach for that would be using a simulation approaches. Um, <clears throat> it's easy to make simulation models. The danger of that is it's easy to make really complicated ones that you don't learn anything from. So let's, let's make sure we understand that caveat as well. And with that, thanks so much. <clears throat>